for this week comes from Rays of the One Light by Swamiji, Swami Kriyanandaji. And he, this book, it, for those who don't know, is uh, at Ananda, our teachings involve, uh, originally, Babaji came to Swami Sri Yukteswar and said, I want you to compare the underlying truth between the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. And so in that spirit, Swami Sri Yukteswar wrote The Holy Science. And you can read it and what he wrote about the belief between those scriptures and the truth uh, behind them and how they share the truth. And, of course, this underlying truth is called Sanatan Dharma as well. And so that's what we practice. And so every week that's why we read from Rays of the One Light or um, the longer version of this was called Rays of the Same Light. And we usually read both things to kind of see which one might be more applicable. But that's why you'll often hear Swamiji comparing the two in our reading every week and, and feeling the underlying truth behind uh, both scriptures. So this one is called The Promise of the Scriptures. Truth is one and eternal, Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 5, we read the famous parable of the prodigal son. Jesus tells of the man who took the wealth bestowed on him by his father and squandered it in foreign lands, where he fell into evil ways. At last repentant, he returned to his father's home. When his father saw him, he was, as it says, moved with compassion and ran and fell upon his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Fetch quickly the best robe and put it on him, and give him a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and bring out the fattened calf and kill it. (laughs) And let us eat and make merry. (laughs) These were desert people. (laughs) Because this my son was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry. It's hard to grow vegetables in sand, I think. (laughs) Small-hearted human beings, identified as they are with their little egos, give exaggerated importance to any slight they receive from others. Thus, they imagine God, like them, to be petty, unpardoning, and vindictive. In God's eyes, however, when human beings go astray, 
there is nothing to forgive. All of us are aspects only of his own self. He who made us resides in us. He is not far away from us in some far off heaven. He's, his call to us always is to return to our own home within. The way of return is described in the Bhagavad Gita in the sixth chapter. Supreme blessedness is that yogi's who has completely calmed his mind, controlled his egoactive tendencies, rajas, and purged himself of desire, thereby attaining oneness with Brahma, the infinite spirit. Thus, through holy scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. I'd like to begin with a reading from Whispers from Eternity. This is Paramahansa Yogananda's Book of Prayer Poems. And this is called, I Was Made for Thee. I was made for thee alone. I was made for dropping flowers of devotion gently at thy feet on the altar of the morning. My hands were made to serve thee willingly, to remain folded in adoration, waiting for thy coming, and when thou comest to bathe thy feet with my tears. My voice was made to sing thy glory. My feet were made to seek thy temples everywhere. My eyes were made a chalice to hold thy burning love and the wisdom <coughs> falling from thy nature's hands. My ears were made to catch the music of thy footsteps echoing through the halls of space and to hear thy divine melodies flowing through all heart tracks of devotion. My lips were made to breathe forth thy praises and thine intoxicating inspirations. My love was made to throw incandescent searchlight flames to find thee hidden in the forest of my desires. My heart was made to respond to thy call alone. My soul was made to be the channel through which thy love might flow uninterruptedly into all thirsty souls. Well, this is nice. This is our first sort of normal satsang since we've opened the temple. It's funny to think that that was more than a month ago. And here we are having our first standard format satsang. We had Deepavali in the middle. We had some broadcasts of Jyotishji and Deviji that we were watching in place. And so now we're back. And nice to see you all online as well. Um, Jyotishji and Deviji had a very large program in Mumbai yesterday on the autobiography of a yogi. And we haven't heard much yet, but except that it went very well. And so look for the pictures and for the recordings and all that. It's wonderful. They're now in um, Pune, Mumbai, sort of as their base, but they're in Bangalore next week, as many of you know. Some of you will be going to see them, then in Pune to see them, and then some will go to Puri also to see them. So they're in the closer to us uh, in spirit now, and in fact, geographically, and soon in, uh, in literal proximity when you go and see them. This story of the prodigal son from... Uh, the Bible is such a beautiful story. It's important to remember that Jesus often taught in stories. He taught in metaphors. And so he didn't always come out right and say what his teaching was. When he was with his disciples, he did. But when he was speaking to the large gathering of the public, he spoke in these stories that were symbolic. And he often said in, uh, very directly, he who hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know, uh, meaning like, can you grasp the, the underlying truth of what I'm trying to say? It was important for him to present teaching in that way for various reasons that I won't go into right now. But this story of the prodigal son is perhaps one of the most sweet. And it's much longer than, is, than was just retold in this reading. 
and I won't tell the whole story. But essentially, what it focuses on is how the this son, um, who was the younger of the two sons, at least the two that are mentioned, uh, basically asked his father for his inheritance early and said, give me all the money that is due to me and bakalam, I'm going to have some fun. And so he did. So he wandered the air, the whole area and he had started off with lots of money so I'm sure he had lots of friends and there was lots of, uh, you know, uh, frivolous living, high living. They have a great phrase. He, he spent his time in riotous living. You know, just... <laughs> riotous living. And so then he went on and on in this way, thinking the money would never run out, and as everyone thinks, until it does. And then he found himself with nothing and all the friends left and I'm sure he accumulated some debts too or if he didn't, let's throw in that too. And, you know, basically went down, down, down and then was more or less living on the street. And um, I forget, I think what finally pushed him over the edge was that he was um, looking for food and he was uh, eating the husks of something, some plant, some uh, un ined barely edible husk of something, of a husk of something you would not want to eat. And that it basically was, as far as my memory goes, is fed to the pigs. And so he was sort of, you know, fighting with the pigs over the husks. And he thought, what am I doing? You know, even in my father's house, even the lowest servant is better taken care of than this. And so let me return home and approach my father just asking, because he was so ashamed of what his life had become. Because it's like how we learn all our lessons. Everybody says, not everybody, somebody wise says, don't do it. And we say, I'm going to do it. It's going to be fine. And then we discover to our horror that, that we shouldn't have done it. Sometimes that's the only way for us to learn is we found out for ourselves that it was a dumb idea. And we just had to rediscover that for ourselves. That's not only the way we learn, but sometimes it's the way that others learn too. Sometimes people just have to carry their line of thinking, of riotous living, to its own natural consequences. And then it becomes clear. And so keep that in mind as well. If you're trying desperately to save someone from themselves, sometimes they have to save themselves. Or God has to save them. And meanwhile, pray. Do pray for them. But they have to fight their own battles. So he came back feeling very ashamed and thought, I will apply for work in my father's household. He didn't, you know, he didn't, he felt he had no right after all of his errors and he had to pay the penalty and expected that everyone, of course, would say, how dare you show your face? And so he said, I'm, all, I'm only going to apply for work because at least I won't have to eat the husks anymore. And so he returned to the house, ready to the, you know, the house is sort of described as this big place, a, a metaphor for God's kingdom. And he, uh, you know, with his job application, and he, of course he had his photo and everything, and he had his other card and everything, so he could apply for a job. And so, and then when he got there, he, approached, he saw his father coming, and he said, you know, sir, I'm basically just coming to ask for a job. And the father instead of saying what we would expect, how dare you show your face, where is all the money I have given you, what have you done with it, how ridiculous, I would like an account of all of the spending and where it has gone, give some justification, did you pay TDS, and all, I mean, the whole thing that you would expect. He just said, let us make merry and celebrate because my son who was dead has returned. He completely forgives him. He doesn't even talk of forgiveness. I know there was a lot of riotous living, but that's okay. He doesn't even mention it. He just says, you're back. I'm so glad to see you. Go get the fatted dosa and prepare it, and we will make merry. And, you know, 
dosa with ghee. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Get the ghee, roast dosa, and we will Extra celebrate. Ghee and masala. <laughs> And so that's, that's what he says. Again, there's no word of forgiveness. There's no word of uh, anything. <coughs> he just simply says, you're back. And so Swamiji makes the point that we, because we are conscious of our own errors, or even more common, we are conscious of those errors that were done to us. And that it's hard for us to forgive even, why did he step on my foot? He could as well look where he's going kind of thing, that then we think God will be equally vindictive, equally unforgiving, equally just saying, well, it's about time, but we'll see this kind of damning attitude that, well, I see you bothered to come back now, maybe you'll listen to me. Hmm? All of this kind of criticalness. And we don't really have that from God. Is something going on? There's all... It, our people. Does any no one has a car that's does anyone a, have a car that might have been parked next Swift to the Swift TN six eight five one? No. Can you can you find what the color? Number? What color is it? White Swift. A white Swift. Is a white Swift belong to any of us here? Do you no. mind telling him that we don't him. have You told him it's not ours? Yeah. Okay. okay. And he he was convinced? <laughs> no, do you mind going and telling him again just because we don't Maybe Sharmilla yeah. White. Yeah, Sharmilla, why don't you tell him? Okay. Yeah. So it's the same same way that you know God forgives you if you park in front of his gate. <laughs> but still we should not you know purposely say well God would forgive me and so what's your problem? <laughs> so we still have to be gracious and sensitive and <laughs> inclusive of others realities and we want to have good relations with our neighbors. So um the uh What's so sweet about this is some, it's for us to always remember how loving, how gentle God is with us, how patient. I was trying to think of a good metaphor, and I couldn't really come up with one. I sort of thought, if you've ever had the experience of a very small child who makes a mistake or even gets mad and says, I won't do it. And... But the child is so kuti, and their voice is so high-pitched, and they're so cute, that even though they're acting all defiant, we sort of go, oh. <laughs> And it's just like, you know, there's no, we don't hold it against them. How dare you address me with that tone? We don't, I mean, it's like, look, they're two years old, and they're upset because they want more murika or something like that. I mean, it's no big deal. And we just think of it as cute. And so that's how God thinks of us. It's just cute when we get mad and when we make all these mistakes and errors and so on. He doesn't, it doesn't bother him at all. He just thinks it's cute. And so the problem with this whole thing with the child is the child gets older and older and taller and taller and the disappointments become greater and greater. And anyway, finally the child is 56 years old and he's just kind of like... Won't you ever listen? And so there's all of this. So that's part of what gets to us. And all of that is the ego. The ego is not very forgiving. Our egos are not very forgiving of ourselves. Egos are not very forgiving of other egos. Reminds me of something, though, that was very sweet. There was a man uh, from another country coming through... Uh, Security in, a, in an airport. We were, we were also flying somewhere very late at night, um, boarding a plane, and he was, I think it was in Pune, and he was going through the, um, uh, you know, the scanner, and he's, his uh, bag went through and was not okay, and so they said, you have to, uh, you know, open it up and show us, and he was just so irritated and I, I got the impression that he was a salesman or that this was somehow equipment he always had to bring and he opened it up it didn't look it didn't make any sense to me I had no idea what it was but it was all very carefully packed and he gave you know he just was so impatient and it seemed like this was probably the 76th time in his life he had to unpack the package and show everybody what this thing was which they wouldn't comprehend so he would just 
important. And this is a thing. And and the guy was saying, the the security guy was saying, you know, well, sir, I have to see. And he's in. You're not going to understand it anyway, but it's perfectly fine. I flew here, didn't I, with it? It's the same thing. And, you know, we were right behind him, and he was just going on and on and on. And finally, he just, you know, as he closed it, he said, he turned to me, I guess, as sort of, I mean, I don't know why, and just said, I hate this. (laughs) (laughs) And I... I, I, uh, you know, I didn't really say anything, um, but because I didn't want to, because he was kind of, he was being rude to the the security guy, and so I didn't really want to encourage that. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I also didn't want to say, you know, I'm so sorry. You know, I, uh, I didn't know what to say, but I noticed <coughs> the security guy was very even keel the whole time. He didn't react. He didn't get intimidated either, but he didn't also say one more word and we're taking you off the plane or anything. He just was even-minded about it. And so after the guy huffed away to, you know, go get ready to face the person at the ticket counter, I turned to the security guy and I said, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that could have been pretty frustrating. I don't, I don't know what that man's problem, you know, what the challenge was. And it was amazing how you just kind of handled it. And he said, well, sir, it's probably some ego problem. (laughs) And I thought, only in India, you know, it's like you get Vedic teachings going through the security. It's like, that's right. It's an ego problem. That's, in fact, my problem, too. That's, That's the whole problem of everything. It's an ego problem. And so it's like it's the ego that is that is uh, stingy with forgiveness. The ego that holds back. I cannot forgive that I was so affronted, and that I was treated in such and such a manner, and so on. And so again, because that's how we can find ourselves thinking, or we can find other people thinking that towards us. Well, I said I'm sorry. And just ha. Then we think that God thinks the same way because that's how everybody else thinks so God being part of everybody else must be the same way but he's not at all he's so much wanting us home he wants us back home just as this father in the story wants us back home more than we want to come home and so when you finally get on the spiritual path and start seeking and find how hard it is we can start to think that you know, well, it's be, I have to awaken God's interest. I have to get his attention. As Master said, he's throbbing in your heart. He's the nearest of the near, the dearest of the dear. He's closer to you than your own thoughts. He's closer to you than the words with which you pray. And so how do we feel that? And it really comes down to that. How do we feel it? We have to feel it. We can't just think it. It's something we have to feel. We are studying the, um, in our weekly class series right now, the book Religion in the New Age, or rather the essay Swamiji wrote called Religion in the New Age. And a statement that he makes in that book regarding ego and this how do we feel God's presence is that he said the only way for the ego to loosen its grip on our mind is through is when our mind is in touch with higher consciousness. I think he says more something more like it is only when the mind is in touch with higher consciousness that the ego's grip is loosened. And that is quite a statement because if you've had that experience, which I am sure you all have, something is different when we meditate, when we feel peace a peace that's much deeper than the normal just stopping of irritation outwardly, but a deep sense of peace. Something in us changes, something in us is nourished, is fed, that we can't forget. Something that, that again, changes us. That's the mark of a true spiritual experience, is that you find yourself changed afterwards. Two easy ways to tell whether it was a true experience, whether it was inspiration or indigestion, is that you can remember the experience vividly as soon as you bring it back to your mind. Every detail comes back as if you are right in it again. It's not like a dream where I had a dream and 
Babaji was there and it was so great because we were having coffee and I was surprised to see him drinking. Oh no, it was Lahiri Mahash. No, wait, it was it, was it Sri? You know, it wasn't coffee. You know, that normal, you try to remember a dream and the details are vague. And so this is so vivid that it's again just as if you're having the experience again. It, that gives you the sense that it's super conscious and not subconscious. The other is that it changes you in some way. For example, that you might get a message from the master about a certain something that heals a particular hurt in your heart or corrects a misunderstanding and you never doubt it again. You never go back. You never go, well, I mean, I mean, Jesus and Krishna both appeared and said, you're doing fine, but I don't know. I don't know if I, you know. It's sort of like you know it is, and even if no one else believes you, you are strong in that. So, when we have these experiences, when we feel, for example, <coughs> this peace or this comfort in the heart, something in us changes. And so it's really only through these experiences, when our mind is in touch with higher consciousness, that the ego's grip is loosened. So, first of all, that tells us that these are the kinds of experiences to seek. If we want the ego's grip to be loosened, if we want to find God, we have to put our mind in touch with higher consciousness. We can read a lot, and that's fine. But after a point, reading is just pedestrian. As a, That's the snobbish word that the uh, mathematicians and physicists use. You know, it's not, it's not real science. It wasn't your work. It, you're just pedestrian, just strolling through the works of other great minds. You know, it's very snobbish. So I don't mean it in that way. But the yogi is practical and gets impatient with just words about feeling. I mean, if you're hungry, if you had this experience of being really hungry and not being able to eat, and then somebody says, oh, I could really have a nice vada right now, perfectly crispy with that little crunch at the be just like, shut up! Don't, you're making it worse. You know, I'm already starving and you're talking about good food. I want to eat it. I don't want to hear about it. And we should be that way with God. Not that we don't want to hear about him, but just that hearing is not enough. I want that peace myself. We should, be, we should remember that when it's time to meditate in the evening and, you know, I don't know about today. I did a lot of praying, so maybe um, that counts. And I think I'll skip my kriyas and, you know, mm, you know, we listen. It's sort of like, meanwhile, the heart and the soul are saying, give me the vada, give me the vada. And we're, oh, I, don't, I don't know if I feel like it today. I mean, it's just nuts when you think about it. Especially because why are we here? This was a thought that came out in the level four class yesterday. Why are we here? We get so fascinated with this life. This is my life. This is my job. You meet someone. Okay, Berena, uh, what is your name? And Workena, what is your work? <laughs> and, well, you know, where is your house? Vitenge. And have you always lived in Chennai? And all these kinds of very important questions. These are the questions we ask people when we meet them so we can understand them. And these are the questions we are always answering. Yes, my name is this. My PAN number is this. And so on. <laughs> as if... This is really our identity. This is really important. But what was your PAN number in the last life? <laughs> you don't know. What was your name in the last life? We don't know. But our name in the last life was just as important to us as this name is to us now. But it's just as meaningless. And if that doesn't make sense, think of the next life. You won't even know that your name was Napoleon. <laughs> He's already heard the speech because he was in the class. You won't even know. And even if someone told you, I have seen that in your last life you were born in Chennai, and, or sorry, uh, anyway, never mind, and that you lived in um, that place near the beach, and your name was Napoleon, and it was spelled a little differently, and all these things. Even if you knew, you would say, who cares? I don't live near the beach now. And it's not my name now. And think about it, even getting these naughty readings. Someone tells you right now. I mean, all the things about yourself that you already know. 
you learned how to drive a car at an early age. It says, who cares? It has nothing to do with who you really are. And so, I was, <laughs> I was thinking as I said to them, Suppose instead of someone asking you your name, job, place, where do you live, have you always lived in Chamal, Tamil, Chennai, Tamil, Pesaringa, all these things, instead of that, suppose they just said, what is your uncle's second child's name? And you would say, mm, Ripati, you know. And they'd go, oh, okay. And you'd go, well, that's nice, but my uncle's second child's name really has very little to do with me. You know, the amount of DNA shared between me and my uncle's second child is very little. And so, you know, it is, it's fine to tell you, but that uncle's second child's name is as relevant to you as your name, as your job. I mean, what was your job in the last life? Who knows? Who cares? What does it matter? You either paid the bills or you didn't. Anyway, you're here now. It's over. <laughs> What you've become through that experience is lasting. That's relevant. What your consciousness is now is very important. Your connection with the guru is permanent. Master said the connection with the guru, once formed, is eternal. Eternal means not only lifetime to lifetime, but also even after you become free. It's not like when you become free, you go down to the, the lobby desk and the guru's there and you say, thank you very much, I'm checking out and I had a nice day and see you later. You keep that connection with him even afterwards. So we see Jesus bowing <coughs> to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said, you know, I am not fit to open the latchet of your shoe. I'm not fit to remove your chapels. How can you ask me to baptize you, to bless you? He was the guru of Christ. But Christ had exceeded him in his spiritual awareness, so Master explained. And Jesus said, suffer for it to be so, which basically <laughs> means do it even though you don't want to, because um, uh, thus we shall fulfill all righteousness. Meaning, this is the Dharma. You are my guru. And Master said, Jesus, though he was greater than John the Baptist, bowed to John the Baptist because John the Baptist was his guru. And the soul never forgets the eternal debt of gratitude. It owes to the guru. Guru, of course, only as an agent of God. It's God, really, who is the guru. But still, if somebody has helped get you out of the prison, do you say thanks? I could have done it on my own anyway. And you know, and, and you took quite some time, actually, in doing it. <laughs> no, you say, thank you for getting me out. Thank you. And so Jesus said, no man born of woman is as great as John the Baptist. And Master points out, Jesus was born of woman also, but he was placing John the Baptist even above himself because he was his guru. So, remember that too. The bond once formed with the guru is eternal. And then it's, it's a bond also of friendship at that point. But in any case, that is who you really are. You know how when you're a kid or even when you're an adult, you visit all kinds of people during the day and you go to the shop and you say, uh, hello, I would like, you know, these coffee packets. And then you go to the side and thank you very much and happy. Isn't it funny what's happening with all the small, I'll pay you in hundreds and with the small bills only and all this thing. And then you go to the bank and you say, oh, the line is too long today. And then you go to all these different places and meet all these clerks and other people. And imagine especially that it was in some strange city, not your normal routine where you actually have relationships with the people. But you you're just going in some strange city and saying, you know, uh, uh, whatever I need to do. And then you come from that city back home and you meet your uh, family, the, the nice ones. And so you see them all and you're happy to see them all. And these are just other human beings, just like everybody else that you saw, but they are particularly significant to you. There's a heart connection. There's, you've had years together. There is a, a bond of friendship and everything. Again, it's the, the part of the family with whom you feel that. And so, your heart opens and you feel, this is, these are my people. And so, that is what happens in one day, really what happens with us lifetime to lifetime. 
we walk around and we have all these families and all this and we're now I have someone who is my uncle but in the last life he was my child and he still thinks he's my child and I still think I'm his parent because even though he's 40 years older than me he's asking can't you please take care of me and I'm saying oh I'm so worried about him it's like he's you know 60 he's fine but oh no but I remember when he was kuti it's like he's not kuti anymore so we have all these different relationships with different people. Sometimes we're born into a family of strangers because that's the particular karma we have to work out. And then we come home from all of that in that lifetime when we get back onto the spiritual path. And we find the guru again. And we're drawn to his picture, we're drawn to his teachings, we're drawn back into the spiritual family. We resume our sadhana right where we left off and we say, ah, oh, now I'm back with my people. Now I'm back with my guru. Because that relationship continues lifetime to lifetime. Just as in this life, the relationship with the family continues day to day, uninterruptedly. So the relationship with the guru, each day of a lifetime, we still come home to the guru if we're lucky. And so that's the real relationship that continues. And the relationship with God continues. So we have to think of what is actually lasting and permanent in our reality over just the particular moments of the day. Do you remember the name of every clerk that you met? Did you even ask? And so it's not as important to you. It's okay, be nice, you know, go out and ask someone their name and be nice to them. But in the grand scheme of our existence, it's not that relevant. They have other people who know their name and we know the name, they didn't ask our name. <laughs> and so you have to remember that your name, your job, your place of birth, all of that is meaningful in this life, but it's like a day. It's like one day. And it's not, it is as relevant really to your reality as your uncle's second child's name. It's not, I don't even have an uncle. Well, then fine, even less relevant. It's who you are, who you are becoming, your relationship with the Guru, your soul merging into God. That is your reality. So, when it's time to do the second meditation in the evening, and time to do the second round of Kriyas, or whatever it is, no, 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 thank, that's okay, I need to go, there's, a, there's one more episode of this TV show I don't want to miss. I'm not saying it to be harsh or critical. I'm not saying it to say... Mm -mm -mm at all. I'm just saying, what are we here for? We have as much time as we need. That's the good news and the bad news. We have as much time as we need. And why is it bad news? Because we're hungry for that vada. And we're not getting fed. You know, if you've ever been in a period where you've been very stressed and you don't eat rightly and you sort of are always having snack food and after some of you are nodding and some of you are not no that has never happened to me I have never <laughs> eaten a whole bag of murka in one sitting ever <laughs> you know how if you've ever done I've heard friends of mine have told me this that I'm joking well I've done it myself that after a, like a day or two of that, you develop sort of a gnawing hunger, even though you've sort of been eating something because you haven't been nourished. And so there's this, I need some real food. I need some vegetables. I need something healthy. I need some real food. Because even though I've been eating, it hasn't really been feeding me. And so that's what gets to us. Too much of material living, too much of sort of <coughs> difficult human relationships. And we develop that hunger for real love, for real peace, for real joy. And all of this stuff that I'm having is not nourishing me. It's not enough. That's why we get impatient with the time it takes to find God. That's why it's bad news that it takes extra time. I mean, that it might take extra time. But remember, He's calling us and wanting us home more than even we are wanting Him. And so think of these small moments when your mind is in contact with higher consciousness. That's what changes you. And so even the moment in the, in the company of a saint can be your raft over the ocean of the delusion, of delusion, so the scriptures say. Because if your mind is just once put in contact with that higher consciousness, it changes you. So... Be grateful for those experiences you've had because that's really what puts you on the spiritual path and that's what's keeping you here. And seek more of them. 
It isn't enough to say, well, I had one once and that was enough. No, it should develop in us a hunger for more. But also, be patient with others who haven't yet had those experiences in this lifetime. Because we can try sometimes in our enthusiasm to try to get others onto the spiritual path. I remember a friend of mine when I read Autobiography of a Yogi. This friend and I were in college and we would always talk about um, the truth and the nature of reality and meaning. What is the meaning of this life? We're in college and it's sort of the right time of life to be doing such things. And then I found Autobiography of a Yogi and I said, Hey, this is it. And I had, we had, I had recommended all kinds of things to him that he had been interested in. And he, he had recommended things to me that I had been interested in. And in the same nature of being fair-minded and finding something wonderful, I found this book and said, Hey, man, here's the book. You've got to read it. He said, No, thanks. <laughs> I know all about that religion stuff. And I am not interested and I thought, what? I mean, you haven't even read the book. You didn't even read the back jacket. I mean, you don't know anything about it. How do you know you don't like it when you haven't even opened it? And you, we were happy about everything else. And so I was talking to him at dinner saying, no, no, you don't understand. I mean, it's a story. There's lots of stories. And it's not just preachy or philosophical. It's a story of his life. He's writing of his own experiences. No, I don't want it. And I didn't have the good sense to go, okay, and let it go. I was, no, no, but you don't understand. It, I mean, don't you want to know the truth? Isn't that what we've been talking about this whole time? All these years of philosophy, we want to find the truth. And so it's here, or at least it could help you. At least try. No thanks. So then dessert came. And I ordered mango sorbet. And uh, I got it, and I tasted it, and I just went... Wow, this is great. You should try it. No, because he was on a roll. I mean, once you say vain dam, vain dam, vain dam, you can't even remember the other word. It's just yellow vain dam. And so he said, no, I don't want that either. I have my dessert. I forget what it was. I'm content. So I said, again, stupidly, man, you really got to try this. It's really good. Mm. You really want to try it? So finally... At the end of it, just to shut me up, he caved in. And he just went, Wow! That is the best mango sorbet I've ever had. That's the best thing I've ever tasted. And I just wanted to say, this I had the good sense to not say, but I was thinking to say, You see? You know, I'm trying to tell you. This is what you want. And so I even sent him an email afterwards saying, Just... Think you would really like the autobiography of mango sorbet? <laughs> <laughs> to this day, vain dumb. No, I don't want it. I don't want it. So, that could have been our attitude as well. So be grateful that it wasn't. Be grateful that it wasn't your attitude because he can find God in many ways. It doesn't have to be this path, obviously. But still... For us, it is our path. To us, it's precious. It's saved. For many of us, we feel it saved our lives. Not necessarily saved our lives from death, but saves our lives from non-life. Just know everything's fine. As, as Dhyanaji said, before the path, my life was calm, but bad. You know, it's just sort of like we had perfect lives and they were perfectly useless. It's funny, in fact, <coughs> Swamiji said that about one group of people he was speaking to. He said they're polite and friendly and perfectly useless. <laughs> and he said that because he was trying to convince them about the spiritual path. And finally, one of them said, <coughs> Listen, what you say may be true, but I'm just not interested. <coughs> What can you do? We should be patient. And Swami was very patient with this person. He'd known him all his life. And so this was after about 60 years of the same conversation going nowhere. But still, if when someone gets that taste, then they'll be interested. So let them find their own way. We don't have to worry. And that's true not just of spiritual things, but of worldly things. We try so much, we worry about so much about someone in a certain pattern, doing a certain thing. It's really not our job. 
Swamiji told a story of once where Master corrected him on a situation. There was a man who was running around one of the disciples, always trying to please people. He was serving them, but in an effort to please them, so that he would give them this thing, and they would say, oh, thank you, I'm very pleased, and he would come. And so Swamiji said to him, he, he sort of had a moment with him, and he said, you know, I found, Swamiji said, to his brother disciple, that <coughs> that it's, it's not enough really for me to try to do things to please people. Rather, I've, I've discovered I should try to act in such a way as to please God. And the man, I don't know if he said Avadiya or whatever, but you know, the man, that, that was the end of that conversation. And then a few minutes later, Master came in. Master had been out of the room or the building. Master came in and came right up to Swamiji and said, it's my job to counsel these people, not yours. This was one of the few times that Swamiji was corrected by Master. I don't want to give any misimpression. But the Swamiji reflected that because what he had said, what Swamiji had said was true and in fact is a higher truth. It's higher to act in, the, in such a way as to please God than is to try to please people. But for that man, it wasn't the right teaching. Because for him, if he didn't care about pleasing people, he wouldn't try to please them and he wouldn't do anything at all. He was coming from a lower perspective of, I feel like doing nothing. Oh, but I like it when people praise me. So that motivated him to get up off his bed of rest and serve people. And so that was enough for where he was right now. And he wasn't ready for this higher teaching. But I also liked another aspect of that statement of Master's. It's Master's job to take care of people, not ours. It's not our job to worry about them. It's not our job to see that they learn their lessons. It's not our job even to wring our hands. It's not our job to take responsibility emotionally for someone else. We should pray. We should give. We should serve. We should do everything. In fact, you can do it more because you're not being psychologically drained by the experience of worry, of fear. How much time do we sit at home ruining our days, worried about someone else's struggle? They may be sleeping peacefully. And we're, oh, I hope it works out. I don't mean to be uncaring. It's almost impossible to make a point without realizing, well, on the other hand, and what about you? I've already learned the teaching. I don't care about anybody. You know, that's, so anyway, you have to figure out what side of the spectrum you're on. But for some of us, we just take too much emotional responsibility for someone else's emotions, for someone else's situation, and we forget that God is on the job. He says, it's my responsibility to take care of my child, not yours. Your parents are not your parents, they're my children. Your children are not your children, they're my children. Your friend is your friend, <laughs> but is my child. I'm taking care of them just fine. And so keep that in mind, as well as these precious, increasing these precious moments of peace, of putting our mind in contact with higher consciousness. When people would ask Swamiji, what was your, your favorite memory of Master? Swamiji would often say, that uh, tell the story of being at the 29 Palms Desert Retreat with Master, Master was working on his Bhagavad Gita commentaries. They were alone in the room. And Master was sitting in a chair and Swamiji was sitting at his feet, just gazing up at him, thinking how wonderful it was to be Master's disciple. And Master at that time was having problems with his knees. He was taking the karma on of many of the disciples, so he said, and it was manifesting as physical trouble with his legs. And so he asked Swamiji to help him to stand, to help him to stand up, because it was time to stand up. And so Swamiji, you know, stood before Master and took a hold of his hands and helped to bring him to a standing position. And he said, Master's was just, his face was just this close from Swamiji's. And Master said to him, just a bulge of the ocean. And he, Swamiji knew that because he had been thinking how lucky I am to be his disciple, that Master, <coughs> Master wanted him to know that I'm just a bulge of the infinite ocean. And that's the love you're feeling. That's the love you seek. Don't look to the bulge. Look to the ocean. 
And it just made Swamiji's love for Master deeper. He didn't say, oh, just a bulge? Oh, okay. <laughs> he, because he could see it was that those windows of the soul, the eyes, the windows of the soul, through which Divine Mother was trying to reach him, as Master writes in autobiography. I was aware that the Lord, through my guru, was trying to expand the small ardors, the small love of my heart. It's God through the Guru. It's God through your experiences trying to reach you, trying to put you in touch with His consciousness. And once, once we taste that, we can never go back. Or at least, well, let's say, let, let that be our prayer. That now in this life, once we have tasted it, not only let us never go back, but let us go all the way and get home in this lifetime. God bless you. <laughs>